My Bloody Valentine, a name synonymous with the dreamy distortion of shoegaze, achieved near-mythical status with their 1991 masterpiece, Loveless. But the band's early sound was vastly different, a raw, gothic-tinged post-punk that bears little resemblance to the sonic landscapes they would later sculpt. Their debut mini-album, This Is Your Bloody Valentine, is a fascinating glimpse into a band still discovering itself. Hi, I'm Andy Fenstermaker, and this is Poetic Wax, a weekly music history series where I dig into the record collection I started back in the 1990s to share the stories of bands, albums, and songs from within. This is the story of This Is Your Bloody Valentine, its creation, reception, and its place in the larger narrative of one of alternative music's most influential bands. In 1978, Dublin native Kevin Shields met drummer Calm O'Keesing at a karate tournament, an unusual beginning for a musical partnership. Shields described their connection as instant, an overnight friendship that quickly pivoted to shared musical endeavors. Early iterations of the band included local friends, first as a predominantly Sex Pistols and Ramones cover band under the name The Complex, followed by a post-punk outfit called A Life in the Day. They experimented with names and styles before settling on My Bloody Valentine, a suggestion from vocalist David Conway. Despite its darkly evocative nature, Shields later confessed that he actually didn't realize it was the title of a 1981 Canadian slasher film. Dublin's music scene, however, wasn't ready for the band's unconventional sound. MBV cycled through a number of lineup changes through the early 80s, and Gavin Friday of Virgin Prunes advised them to leave Ireland, telling Conway bluntly to get out of Dublin. Following his advice, the band relocated to the Netherlands for a short stint, where their most notable gig was as an opening act for R.E.M. in early to mid-1984. Leaving the Netherlands, they moved to Berlin, playing sporadic gigs and seeking more inspiration in a more open musical environment. By late 1984, the band settled in Berlin, where they recorded This Is Your Bloody Valentine. With Conway's macabre lyrical style and the band's post-punk influences, the album embodied a dark, brooding aesthetic. Tracks like The Last Supper and Forever and Again showcased jangly guitars and sparse gothic arrangements, with Conway's theatrical baritone lending the songs an eerie edge. Recorded on a minimal budget, the album was rough around the edges. Shields later admitted that the band was still searching for its identity, which is honestly no surprise. While This Is Your Bloody Valentine hinted at the experimentation that would define their later work, it firmly was rooted in the gothic and post-punk movements of the time. And their placement in Berlin kind of solidifies all of that. Released in January of 1985 on Tycoon Records, the mini-album had little promotional backing. Critics at the time compared it unfavorably at that to The Jesus and Mary Chain, whose noisy, feedback-laden sound had just begun to capture public attention. Shields found such comparisons a bit stifling, lamenting how hard it was to break free from those early influences. To no surprise, the album also failed to resonate commercially, which, with limited distribution and virtually no radio play, meant no success. For the band, it was a frustrating start. Still, it served as a learning experience, a stepping stone towards the more ambitious recordings to come. Everything seems to be coming up roses for them at the moment, but it wasn't always that way. Rachel asked them whether, in fact, they really did become disillusioned and decide to split up prior to signing to Creation Records. We weren't exactly going to split up. Like, we weren't going to leave each other, but we were going to we going to get rid of the name of the band and all that kind of thing, you know, and start off playing a few small gigs. By 1987, Conway was a bit disillusioned. 
After a series of modest releases and live performances, he left My Bloody Valentine, citing health issues and frustration with the music industry. Shields would later reflect on this moment as a turning point. The creation thing sort of, you know, made things actually move. I mean, I don't know whether it would have made any difference because all, all that would have happened was that we would have had a different name. As a sort of a band, the whole history behind the band, we'd really become sick and tired of it. So that's why, that's what all that came from, you know, that splitting up business. Conway's departure forced the band to reimagine their sound, leading to the recruitment of Belinda Butcher, whose ethereal vocals would become a defining feature of the shoegaze era. This personnel change marked the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. Conway's gothic sensibilities gave way to Butcher's dreamy, abstract melodies, setting the stage for MBV's eventual evolution into the pioneers of shoegaze. Looking back, this is your bloody valentine. It's rough around the edges and gothic overtones stand in stark contrast to the shimmering layers of Loveless, but they also serve as a glimpse into the journey of My Bloody Valentine, the journey that they took to find their sound. The album would be reissued in 1990, a split between Tycoon Records and Dossier Records, and it's this release I stumbled upon in 2019 at a record store in Vancouver, BC. That, or more likely, the essential, identical, indecipherable bootleg copy on equally blue vinyl. And I snagged it for a very cool 1899 Canadian, which is about 14 and some change US. For fans of the band, this is a curious relic worth revisiting. Not for its brilliance, <laughs> definitely not for that, but for its raw ambition and historical observation. Shields once said, everything we did, even in those early days, was part of the process that got us to where we were meant to be. And for My Bloody Valentine, where they were meant to be was rewriting the rule book of alternative music. This piece of that journey is different, yes, but it's notable for its mere existence. So I'm curious, what do you think of MBV's early work? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and explore more little told stories behind iconic albums. Next, dig into another pivotal moment where Blonde Redhead pivoted their sound from art rock and no wave to dream pop and shoegaze. That is a fascinating one.